So let's go ahead and start. I'd like to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome everyone to this next lecture on FDI trade and development. We're really delighted to welcome Natalia Ramundo to this um, STEG sponsored course on key concepts in macroeconomic development. I think by now, probably most of you know what STEG is. It's a program on structural transformation and economic growth operated under the auspices of CEPR in London. We gratefully acknowledge the financial support for the STEG program from the United Kingdom's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And the STEG program is funded as part of the UK aid effort. We've been really lucky to have over the past weeks, a series of lectures on topics in macro development. And we're really delighted to have Natalia with us today to pick up a, a topic of really fundamental importance, which is the role of FDI in development. Um, Natalia, like the other lecturers in the course, is essentially donating her time. We're really grateful to you for, for making the effort. I'll also thank in advance the staff and the team from CEPR that have organized and made the conference run smoothly. So um, Mandy Chan, Lauren Waring, Kirsty McNeil, um, Nadine Clark in past weeks, I think she's not here today. Just a couple of words on ground rules. First of all, for those of you in the virtual front row, Natalia says she's happy to have you interrupt her with questions along the way. Please don't be shy. I've also mentioned to her that what we've been doing the past few weeks is asking those of you in the front row to put into the chat window um, just a little bit of information about yourselves. She may not have a chance to look at it but she might catch a glimpse as it goes scrolling past. If you can just put your name and the country you're from and the institution where you're doing your PhD, that's a bit of information that gives her a sense of who's there. But please, um, if you're willing, uh, keep your cameras on and to interrupt with questions when you have them. Um, Natalia says that's great. If the, if the interruptions get intense, I reserve the right to step in and, and uh, defer things to later. For those of you not in the virtual front row, and you won't control either your microphone or your camera, the way for you to put questions to Natalia is to enter them in the Q&A window. She won't see it if you put your virtual hand up, but if you enter questions in the Q&A, Joe and I will do our best to answer the ones we can. And so we'll try to pick that up along the way. And uh, some of those questions, if we think they're better left for Natalia, We'll either interrupt her with those questions or we'll save them for the end, the last 15 minutes or so. I think that's all I have to say. And on that, I'll just say, Natalia, thanks. We really appreciate your making the time and the effort that goes into preparing the lecture and we're really grateful. So um, over to you. Thanks, thanks very much for inviting me. No, it's like my pleasure actually. So let me um, share here. Yep. Hey, so let me let me start. So this is going to be a supplemental lecture on trade, foreign direct investment and development. And I would like to start with some basic definitions. So what is a multinational enterprise? What I'm going to call m and &E. It's a firm with operations in more than one country with an ownership stake of 10% or more. So that's the definition. So we are going to talk about parent in the origin countries of the farms or headquarters and affiliate farms in the foreign country. The other related concept is going to be foreign direct invest investment, FDI. This is a concept from the balance of payments and there is this misleading word investment. This refers to financial investment. So it's a financial flow and it's differentiated from portfolio based investment because we take a threshold of equity stake of 10% or more. So you can finance activity of multinational farms, not only with FDI, also with other flows like debt with local bonds, et cetera. And finally, the concept that I will be carrying along is the one of multinational production in MP that refers to the activity of parents and affiliates. And by activities, I mean like sales, employment, output, and other like uh, real variables from the from surveys or financial statements of firms. 
So it's really the activity that they perform in their, in their host countries where they go and operate. So I'm going to be referring by M MP by country I, meaning multinationals from an origin country I in a country L that is the host countries where they operate. And for instance, in general, I will be using sales. So I will refer to MP by country I in L as sales of affiliates belonging to, for, to parents in I operating in L. So that's going to be the language. So what's the outline? So first I'll show you some macro facts, facts that we want models to, to replicate. Then I will, it will be mostly a methodological lecture on models of, of trade and MP. So I'm going to go through them first and Melich and a version of of that, Helma Melisipo, a year 2004. The EK version with MP, uh, this is my work with Andres Rodriguez Claire. Then a kind of a, a synthesis of those two models together to talk about innovation production in the global economy. That's my work with Costa Sarkolakis, also Andres Rodriguez Claire and Steve Ippo. I'll show you some of the subsequent li literature that picked up on these themes. And I have to say the disclaimer is not today. We are not going to talk about the boundaries of the multinational and contracts. That's all Paul Antros' work. And that's a subject of a different lecture and a whole lecture because it's a big literature. Then I'm going to talk about spillovers from an empirical point of view. And I wanna just stress the state of the art in this literature. What's the latest on people trying to measure these spillovers from foreign to domestic farms. I'm going to talk briefly about this paper of Greenstone, Hormert and Moretti, and then recent, um, very recent research on the US by, by Rad Sadler and Felix Tintonot, and about, about Costa Rica um, by Alfaro Urenia, Manelici and Basti. And a paper also by Diana Van Patten of a historical perspective, if I have time, okay? But it's in the slides. So let me jump to the facts right away. So the first fact, it's a uh, one that uh, trade economists are very familiar with, is gravity. So MP flows follow gravity. MP shares, bilateral MP shares, decrease with distance. That's the left picture. And bilateral MP flows increase with uh, GDP in the host country. And you can look at this fact on many shapes and sizes. It's very robust. So we want models to display this aggregate fact gravity. The second fact is that trade and MP, bilateral trade shares and bilateral MP shares are very strongly and positive correlated in the cross section and also if you throw the other time. So we want also this in models. At the aggregate level, the macro model should deliver this, this part. And finally, there is a third fact that comes from farm level data. And here I, I show for two countries, but you can do this with for many countries in the world and it's, it's very robust, is the m &E advantage. So if you go to the panel on the right, this is uh, census data uh, for the US, um, the black bell will show the density on, on log employment for domestic farms, blue for exporters, red for multinationals. So if you take the headquarters of multinationals in the US, they're very big in terms of employment, the red bell. The Spain case shows the same thing, and it's also there, what is there is also the, that um, black bell that shows the foreign affiliates of foreign multinationals operating in Spain, also they are the most productive firms and the largest in their economy. So the m &E advantage goes to way in the home country or also in the host country. So these three facts and one more that I'll show you in a, in a minute will motivate most of the theories, actually. May I ask so a let, question here? Yeah. So I might miss something. So what's the difference between a foreign owned firms and a foreign direct investor? Yeah, yeah. so basically they are in the Spain case and uh, are Spanish multinationals in Spain or, um, or like a foreign multinational that has affiliates in Spain, okay? So those are the differences. In the US, in contrast, we are only like, we have there the headquarter of say General Motors, but Toyota is not there because it's a foreign affiliate. It's an affiliate of a foreign parent. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, so let me do some taxonomy because also this one is going to be useful for what we will have in the models and what we won't have. So let me classify affiliate activities in three boxes. One is what we call horizontal activities, and these are sales to the host market where the affiliate operates. That's very important. That's one of the most important um, activities of this MNE affiliate. The second type of affiliates is export platform activities. And these are sales outside the whole market. So General Motors goes to Brazil, they have an affiliate there, and from there they sell to all Latin America, that's export platform activity. And finally, we have vertical activities that mostly are going to be absent of the models I'm going to show you, because these, are, these vertical activities entail production being split across locations. Uh, we won't have that today. And you can see this in the data by um, the sales or trade flows between parents, parent companies and affiliates in the foreign countries. This is, we, we document in a previous paper that uh, for the median US affiliate, this has zero of, of these flows with their parent, okay? so. It's very, very important because they're very concentrated in very few farms, but the majority of affiliates don't do it. So the models are going to be mainly about one and two. Okay. So this is schematically where we are going to be. So like really very, very schematically, what are the two reasons for pursuing foreign and international activities? market access or efficiency. We're going to go the role of market access in the models that I'm going to show you. In that role, uh, there is a choice between serving those foreign consumers from home uh, or relocating production abroad. If they do it from home, we are going to end up with exports. If they relocate production abroad and they chose to own those facilities, we're going to end up with what is called horizontal and be a horizontal FBI. I'm going to include in this bin also when farms choose to serve foreign consumers in their markets, operating in a country and then exporting from there. So this is going to be um, this export platform activities um, to reach, to have market access, access to foreign consumers. So this takes us to one of the first, um, um, the, like seminal theories of multinationals that is playing with this trade-off between choosing exports or reallocating production. And that theory was called the, the proximity concentration trade-off. So the, the, the dilemma is how to serve these foreign consumers. You can export from a, an existing domestic plant or you can set up a new foreign plant. And in this way, exports and FDI or MP serve as substitute ways of serving this foreign market. The trade-off is that uh, MP implies high sum cost because, or fixed cost, because you have to, to open a new plan, but proximity to consumer, you are there in the host market where consumers are. Exports on the contrary imply um, um, are, are far away from consumers, so you, farms have to incur on the trade cost but they can concentrate production and take advantage of scale economies in one location. That's why it's called proximity versus concentration trade-off. What's in the data, and again here, I'll, I'll show you, it, um, it's, it's, it's a very robust um, evidence at the aggregate level. And I wanna stress this. So we observe empirically the proximity concentration trade-off at the aggregate level, at the firm level, the evidence is mixed because the data requirement to test this, this trade-off, as you're going to see in the theories, are very high. So in general, the, the type of, of evidence we have is like if we regress the log of the ratio of exports to total foreign sales or sales of affiliates in a, in a foreign market, we can do it at the industry level, for instance, uh, we should observe that it uh, decreases with trade costs, right? So we, we, we want to do foreign consumers more through affiliates when trade costs are larger and is positive related to 
some measures of uh, um, uh, plant fixed cost. In general, these measures are related to production, to non-production workers or something like that. And that has to be positive. So in general, our theories will deliver at the aggregate level this trade-off. Sorry, may I ask another question? Yeah. So uh, now I index, I index is referring to destination country, right? J is yeah. industry. Yeah, only here I'm going to use that notation. Okay, yeah. thank you. So yes, because in general, the data, um, most of the evidence is for the US. We have detailed data to clean the, to about, about affiliate, foreign affiliates of US multinationals. That's, that's the VA data has been the more used for, the, for this. But you can think of, if we had all the big bilateral matrix of the world, we could use any source country and any host country, ideally. And that's why it's general been done by industry also, this test to gain Thank more, more, more data. Thank you. Thank you. And these experts yeah. are all from the US, right? Yeah. Yeah, in this case. Yeah. Thanks. So let me start with the first model that is pouring multinational production and P into the Melis Chanet model. And that's the paper I told you about Hartman Melis EPO, year 2004. So this model we have will start with the proximity concentration trade off at the farm and aggregate level. And we have another characteristic that is um, also um, from seminal work in multinational from Marcus and 84. And is that firms can transfer their productivity abroad. And in, in Marcus's work was called knowledge capital. And it's the sense that there is something in the multinational that has this um, public good nature and can be shared across all the units. Okay? It, in our case, it's going to be the productivity parameter. There is more recent evidence that in fact, this seems to be the case. Um, Farms are going to be heterogeneous in productivity. So this is the Melix flavor of the, of the model so that we can replicate the fact that most productive farms are the ones choosing um, MP. And one of the results of incorporating this heterogeneity is going to be that um, the responses to this trade-off, the proximity concentration trade-off is going to be different across farms. So the model will have predictions about this trade-off uh, across industries. And it's going to say something like if industries with more heterogeneity will have uh, more MP relative to export. That's going to be one of the, the, the testable implications of the models. They're going to go and test it. But I'm not going to go there. I'm going to show you the model, the main elements of the model. So um, the setup has N countries only labors, and this, I'm not going to relax these assumptions uh, throughout, continuum of varieties and a CS aggregator with sigma elasticity. Now, farm productivity, as I said, is, is a Melix, Melix type uh, environment, so it's going to be, um, um, it, it, uh, it's going to be um, random, and it's going to be from a Pareto distribution with um, shape parameter kappa. Remember, higher kappa, lower heterogeneity, and vice versa. So we are required here. I did a Pareto with a lower one of one. I mean, just to make notation simpler. And we need a condition about parameters, so everything is finite. Okay. Then there's going to be monopolistic competition, as in Krugman and, and Mellit. So farms are going to price um, um, a markup over marginal cost. And the marginal cost is going to be just the wage um, over uh, productivity. Now, there's going to be variable trade cost to trade. Here is from country I to J. That's how what power IJ means. And then there's going to be a fixed cost of exporting to country J and a fixed MP cost to setting up affiliates in this country. And we can have also domestic fixed cost and an entry cost um, to, to, to have this first stage of entry a la Krugman. I'm not going to do it here. So profits are CS. Um, 
So it's just sales over the elasticity of substitution. Uh, we will have to compute profit uh, from sales to the domestic market, to the export market, each export market, and, and the profits from sales from MP in a, in a host market. So a couple of things to notice, productivity is always the same because um, farms uh, can transfer their productivity abroad. Um, for domestic and exports, you pay the salary in your, in your market because that's where you produce. And if you export, you have to add the tau. In the case of MP, you produce in that foreign market, so you keep track of the wage there. And then the respective costs are added here. So I just assume that the costs are paid on, on in, in labor units in the market of destination. This model, these are linear functions. So this model has a very simple um, cutoff rule. So we have zero profit conditions and we find the marginal farms that are the difference between doing one activity or the other. So we will have an, uh, a marginal domestic farm um, that I denote by uh, phi B, a marginal exporter, phi X to each market, and then a marginal multinational, phi M. Okay, and graphically, and this graph is done under symmetry, so it, it's easy to do. You can, this is kind of um, in, in, in a graph what I just show in equations. So we have this linear function of profits of um, productivity to the sigma minus one for domestic farms, for exporters, for multinationals. And you can easily see that there is a point where it's profitable to export. So farms do so. And then at some point it's more profitable to become multinational. But that happens at the very um, uh, upper end of the productivity distribution. So as we saw in the data, the most productive farms will serve multinationals, the foreign consumers to multinationals, the middle ones to ex exports, and the least productive ones which just stay domestic. Now, there is a catch here, and this is under that symmetry, it was easy for me to, to draw it, and it's also easy to know the conditions under which this is the ranking of cutoffs. In particular, the condition is just a relationship between the, the variable and fixed cost, the variable, the variable trade cost and the fixed cost. Okay. But you can think like if I start running a model under asymmetries, it's more difficult how to check the equilibrium. And there is another one that is also more difficult to check, and in general, you have to impose that under symmetry again is trivial, but not when you start putting some heterogeneity, is that I'm restricting farms to only horizontal sales. I'm not allowing export platforms. So I'm basically assuming an equilibrium where that doesn't happen. So it's because of these reasons that this model um, is a bit stark to do um, quantitative analysis. So how the, the paper goes um, the, is like, as I told you, they are going to derive the proximity concentration trade of equation. That's going to give them a testable implication. And they're going to go to the uh, US uh, multinational data and test it with variation across industries. So I'll show you that. Um, so the model delivers indeed the proximity concentration trade-off, export sales over MP sales, follow an expression that is very easy to solve on the Pareto, and, um, and exports decrease relative to MP um, with, with trade cost, increase with the, the, economy, the, the fixed cost. And then there is this parameter kappa that you remember is the Pareto shape parameter. And the predictions that the authors are going to test is about how this kappa being lower or higher, uh, how it, it correlates with the, this ratio of exports to MP. And they're going to do that across industry. So the intuition is very simple. Um, this is a, the density of a low and high dispersion uh, productivity distribution. These are just some of the cutoffs. 
like the one with high dispersion, the green line, you see has more mass on the right, so you will have more MP activity on that type of industry with a lower kappa. Okay. So as I said, um, this is the most you can do. I mean, I haven't closed the model. It could have, um, of course, have, it can be solved in general equilibrium, but has these star conditions that um, parametric conditions that make it hard to use it to do counterfactuals. Maybe. So we're going to move to a framework that you saw a couple with Melanie Morton and um, a couple of, uh, of, of lectures ago that use the Ricardian EK model, Eton Corton 2002. So this is my work with Andres Rodriguez Claire. So basically, we introduce um, multinational production in this type of Ricardian framework. And the objective there was to have a quantitative general equilibrium model to run contrafactors. So we are going to, to allow for forces in the model, like we're going to allow for trade and MP to be alternative ways to serve a market. Um, we're going to allow for foreign affiliates um, importing intermediates. Uh, we're going to have these um, export platforms. We call it bridge MP, so there is no uh, confusion about like having kind of production fragmentation. We don't have that. So, but we are going to allow for, for uh, funds from A doing MP and B and exporting to C. And then we're going to calibrate this macro model to what we observe in the data, bilateral trade and MP shares. And then we're going to compute gains from openness, from P and from trade. And you can think of other counterfactual exercises. So let me show you how the model goes. So um, let's start with EK trade, right? So let me remind you in a slide what the model, that model was about. So there was N countries, a multi-country model with a continuum of goods, um, D, CS aggregator, as I said, I'm not going to, to go away from this assumption. And productivity here is, um, it's the CLB, sorry, it's my dog. <laughs> um, it's going to be independent free share over B and across countries else. So what is this free share? Well, this is characterized by this TL, the, the scale parameter and the shape parameter theta. So the innovation in their work was really that this was a random variable and had this particular um, extreme value distribution that I'm going to talk about a bit more later. Then um, we have iceberg trade cost to, to ship goods from L to N, and the unit cost of producing this good V in L and ship it to N and um, um, reach consumers in L was just the unit cost, the wage over the productivity times the trade cost. And then what was the, the rule there? There was this head-to-head -head competition. It's a Ricardian model. So we all know how to produce each V. Some are more efficient than others. So who's the lowest cost producer of good V for country N? Well, the most efficient location, okay? Um, and it's because of this head-to-head -head competition feature of the model that fresh share is going to be really important for aggregation, okay? So at the end, we want this distribution here because we want nice aggregation. That's the whole point. So I'm going to talk more about that. So now add MP to this model, okay? Now allow for a good V can be produced in country L with technologies from I and solid N. Okay, so that's going to be the notation. I for source country, L for location of production, N for location of consumers. So now the unit cost of good V producing L with technologies from I to be sold in N has this form. It's basically the same. That is analogous to what I show you. So we produce at the at, at unit cost of inputs. I'm going to tell you more about that maybe it's IL specific. Then we have a productivity for that good V that is not only I specific, but might 
have something from the location we produce. And then we need to ship that good from L to N. That's why we have the tab. So I'm going to have this uh, triple index uh, price. Okay. So I need to tell you these two objects. Where are, where are they? Um, and what we have inside here. But again, we are going to have the, this head to head competition feature. So we all know how to produce B. It just, we need to choose the lost cost producer for good B to serve N. And what's going to be that? The minimum between the technologies and locations. Okay, that's it. That's how uh, you see really how we move a degree away from, from Eton Corpum, the only trade model, with a model where now when P are these technologies and we keep track where these technologies are coming from. So, um, so let me talk about these two objects, okay? I'm going to, to do more regarding the distribution here of this, this random draw, and we, I can do a lot of things also with that. So I call that CIL the national, multinational input bundle, bundle. And you can introduce sourcing through that object, basically. So what you can do is like say, okay, I'm a, an affiliate in L, from I, well, I can source um, labor from, or inputs from, from L, I have to pay a cost, I'll tell you in a second. And then I can bring inputs from all over the world, including home, okay? And then imagine there is a DCS aggregator for that. Now you can restrict, and as you, we do it like this in the paper, just bring um, home sourcing, just bring, um, intermediates from your parent, okay? So you have, the, you have to ship them to the, the, the host country. And then you can use also um, some inputs locally, labor. And then, and this is the case I'm going to go with today, unless I say the contrary, is just imagine you just use labor in your location. Okay, so if you do that, um, then this PILNN, ILN, for good B is just the, the wage divided the productivity in that location, and then you pay an MP cost. I'll say, in, I'll say something else in, the, in a second, and the tau, the trade cost to ship from L to N. So this MP cost is introduced as an iceberg cost, and think about it as an efficiency loss of using a technology in a location that is different from the one it was created. Okay, so it's gamma IL is bigger than one, like a also a trade cost, but it's equal to one if you use that productivity draw in the location where it's originally from. So we will call it MP cost. And just previewing, you, you remember I showed you that this, um, these flows follow gravity. Well, this is the way, the same way, the same way trade models introduce gravity through tau, we're going to introduce gravity through gamma. That's, that's, that's why we need, we use all these wedges. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm going to go from, with this simpler case because I can go a long way solving uh, the model um, um, with closed forms. So as I said, I talk about C, now I'm going to talk about C. So the, again, let me stress that this distributional assumption is for aggregation proper, proper, uh, purposes in closed form, okay? If you don't care about closed form, you can assume whatever you want. But we really wanted these models to have these uh, aggregation properties and then uh, be very clear how identification when we calibrate the model, et cetera. So in, in, in the original paper, we use this what, symmetric multivariate Frechet. And basically think about putting some heterogeneity across locations of production. Okay, so productivity is like location specific. Uh -huh. okay. I'm sorry. Um, so um, I will have there is a characterization of it. We're going to it's going to have a 
a scale parameter that is IL specific, origin, production, location specific. And then we're going to have this row that is the one that introduced correlation. If rho is equals to zero, rows are completely independent across locations. If draw goes to one, we are in the hellman meli zippo world where productivity is the same within the, in any location for that particular technology from I for that good D. Okay, so and then you can think that we can be in cases in between. So the theta is going to be the shape parameter. Now, the assumptions that I'm going to keep is productivity is going to be IID over V over the continuum of goods, and it's going to be independent across origins, I's. So let me talk more, this is my work with uh, Nelson Lane about these functions, these extreme value functions. So basically that symmetric fresher that I just show you, it's a special case of a multivariate max table fresher with some correlation function. So the form of that is the one up here. So the joint distribution of productivity across countries, it's, this is the form of a multivariate max table fresher. So it has this G function, and then uh, we have uh, the, the T's that are the scales and the theta that are the shapes. So what's that this G function? This is a way, it's a type of copula to, in, to incorporate correlation. So the key property of the G function is that it's homogeneous of the degree one. And that gives you max stability. So what's max stability? I've been using this term. So max stability says that if you take fresh air and you take the max of fresh air, you get fresh air. So uh, which fresh air you get? Well, one with the same G that aggregates the underlying scales and then it preserves the shape parameter. So this is a crucial um, property for this head-to-head -head competition models or any ROI model for the map. So you start with fresh air, you take the max or the mean, if you're talking about cost and you get fresh air. So what this property implies is that the conditional and unconditional probability of the maximum coincide. And if you go to your lecture on EK, that's crucial to have this max stability gives you a key implication is it, and is that the probabilities are equal to expenditure shares. It's, it's thanks to this property, the max stability of fresh air that we, we can do that jump there. You remember that the probability of a, a, a country being the lowest so, uh, source is we can also say that is the the share of goods that they import from that country and that is expenditure share. So I can talk more in the Q&A about this, but, uh, but that's why these this, uh, this type of functions are, uh, uh, probability functions are really key for this type of model for aggregation. G needs to have other properties. Um, um, it has to follow a pattern of differentiability. And I'll, I'll tell you in a second why that's important. So now look, there are special cases. So we've been talking about independence. If GS here, you put like a summation. If it's additive, that's independence. That's the EK case. If it's symmetric, say it's, it's C, the CS, it's a CS function. We are back on the case I just showed you that we used in the MP case. Now, what is what is in, what, what, what using these max tables for share with the G function implies is that you know where we're going in terms of expenditure shares. So basically a multivariate max table for share distribution for productivity is equivalent to being in the general extreme value GV expenditure. This is a McFadden result. So you can always give me a import demand system that is GEV. And I can always back it up with a Ricardian model where productivity has this form with a given G. So you can, and again, this is like Eton Corto, okay? So trade shares 
have this form where you have the, 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 the scales here, um, the unit cost, and then you have the G function um, uh, aggregating those, those, those unit cost index. And then this GL is the first derivative of that function. So this is the form of GED. Think about EK when we have independence, so we have an additive G. So G here is summation. That's what we had there. And the derivative is one, right? So this term goes away. So you get your CS uh, import demand system as in EK, as in Arcolapis, Postino, Rodriguez, Clair. So this is a, this takes you to a more general um, um, class of expenditure. So in our case, with multinational production, we introduce correlation. Of course, now farms can be uh, from one place, can be in many places. So the, the G function that corresponds to this case is a, what is called a cross-nested CS. And it has this form over here. So we aggregate over, we have um, this outer nest that tells us um, um, that each nest corresponds to a home country. So knowing the general properties of this G allows me to relax some assumptions, okay? So for instance, I can allow for this row to be uh, home country specific. So I put a sub I there. Then I can have more general trade and empty cost. They don't have to be iceberg, okay? They can be embedded on these T's. So just to be precise, the unit cost of producing with V in L with technologies from I to deliver to N, it can be written this way. WL over a productivity draw that has the triple, triple um, subscripts instead of already assuming that those of it, there is like a iceberg type cost. What is key in all this is that I will cut the hardwire property here is that productivity has to be IID over the continuum of goods B. And that's a property that is uh, difficult to relax. And also I kept the property that uh, productivity is IID across I. We have cases where we, we, we know how to relax it. That's easier. Okay, we do it in, in the paper with Nelson. So Did yes, I, I want to ask a question. Yeah, Joe, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I don't, I don't teach this, but I want to teach this. Uh, um, but with the two setups, um, it seems to me like the, uh, the one with the trade costs and the platforming, the, the gamma and the tau, uh, is, is, I mean, the, other, the, the, the left is more general, but can you identify the left? Because I thought usually we put the parameter, parametric restrictions to identify. Yeah, we do that. Um, um, we can... You are right. Uh, we, we, we need some, we are going to go to gravity at some point again, to identify some of these things. But I wanna point out that it's not necessarily that you have to, to assume that, okay? It can be uh, all embedded on, on, the, on the margins, basically, of the distribution. It's, it's, it's just a way. If you were talking about, I wanna um, be more general because you can use this for any ROI model. So you can, my, a migrant choosing where to go and occupations or somebody choosing occupations, everything that has had to have competitions, you can use um, this type of distributions if you care about aggregation again. <laughs> so, um, but now, um, and we didn't know this when we wrote that paper, um, this, this came after. So now I know how expenditure has to look like in my model of multinationals. So, um, so again, what I'm after, why I'm doing this? Uh, at the end, what I wanna take to the data are flows, expenditures. Uh, some I'm going to observe them, some not, not because they are not there, just because the data are limited. Um, so that's why I wanna have these objects characterized. And, and because I want to characterize the gains, the welfare gains. So expenditure in, in, in N of goods produced in L with technologies from I, we have um, 
it will come from this cross nest TCA. So we will have a familiar expression. Expression. If you're familiar with sectoral models, this is this is if you replace I with S for sector, this is an expression say in Caliendo Parro. Okay. So we have a within I expenditure or within sector if you were in the sectoral model, and then a between nest expenditure between eyes in this case. And, um, and then we have this, um, we call it uh, price indices, they are defined here. So um, this, is, this is nice because this will take us to gravity. So at the uh, home country level, we have like a gravity expression that we can po potentially use to estimate um, elasticities. Now, in, in the paper with Andres, we were in the special case, as I told Joe, where we decompose these T's in, in the index for iceberg trade and MP cost. And then we also are a bit less general on these rows. So now it's easy to, to know, to, we have expressions and we, we can compute bilateral trade. That is sum over I of this XILN. Bilateral MP with sum over N, and we have MP from I to L. Those are things that we observe in the data. And then we have total expenditure that we also observe in the data. But now what I can do is I'm going to use a sufficient statistic approach to characterize gains. That's why I wanted to characterize the flows. So what I'm going to do is like what um, is done in Arcolakis, Costino Rodriguez. Claire, the ACR formula, I'm going to do it for this more general class, the GV class instead of CS, and then I will apply it to my model with multinationals. So, um, and this is in, in our paper with, with, with Nelson, gains from trade for GV class can be characterized as the, the trade share and something related to correlation is, is the, the derivative of these Gs, okay? So under independence, this derivative is one, you are, you are back to ACR, CS. But in, any, in other cases, every time you, you have some correlation across countries in technologies, you are going to have less gains from trade because partners are more similar to you. So there is less scope for comparative advantage, okay? So the case of independence, given the elasticities is an upper bound for gains from trade. So let's apply that to our model. I mean, I know exactly how I just, I know this function, so I can, I can do that. So for this cross net CCS subclass, that is my MP model, the gains from trade are, again, the, these, these, these uh, domestic shares um, divided by the correlation. And I can, again, this is, this is the algebra, I can characterize that correlation in terms of flows. And I will have around flows that are observable. Okay, again, if rho is equal to zero, zero um, only this term will su survive, right? And here, what I wanted to make explicit is this summation over I, I didn't do it here, okay? So when I talk about the gains from trade, I'm talking about a situation where I go from trade to trade and MP. Sorry, I'm going to a situation from only MP, technologies are allowed to flow around the world, but not trade, and then I move to also trade. Okay, so I'm going to call that the gains from trade. And I didn't say that, but the gains are always computed as differences in real wages. Okay, so um, again, if you have data, a lot of data, you could kind of fill in the blanks here and compute these gains. We don't have so much data. Um, so we are going to go around this. this yeah, I have a question on this. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of data, so uh, so understand that for your AR white paper with Costas and also uh, the ARP MP 15 paper. So you use this 1999 MP flow data. So I'm curious, is there any updates for the MP flow data uh, currently? Yeah, other people did it, <laughs> not us. <I> see. Okay, <laughs> but thank there you. are updates, yeah. <laughs> but um, the, here the problem 
is the, the you see that it's a triplet. That's a problem. So sometimes we don't have the triplets. For one country, a very important one, the US, we have them. So um, that, that's good news. I think Japan also had them and uh, Korea. So let me just define a couple of things um, where we are going. Again, this paper was about, and the model was just about computing games, quantifying games. And I just wanted to review the methodology of that. I'm not going to tell you the numbers because, you know, like uh, data were all, and now we have better data, et cetera. So I'm going to call the gains from trade star when I go to isolation, total isolation to trade and gains from MP star when I go from total isolation to MP. And those are very easy gains to compute. It's just an ACR type of formula, okay? You need the domestic shares of trade or MP and some elasticity. The gains from trade, the ones that I just showed you, is I have only MP and I go to trade and MP. And then the gains from MP are just a combination of things that I calculated before. And then I have the gains from open. Okay, I go from total isolation to open up to these two uh, flows. These gains are always uh, positive, basically. And you can make the, the special cases where the rows are zero, we revert to, to a case with, with only like a CR type formula, this is the independence case, etc. Here we are contemplating the fact that MP allows us to trade stuff around, etc. But in this paper, we want you to kind of say, okay, what's the relationship between these, these gains? Well, we say if, if we have, if the gains from trade gives are bigger than, than the gains from trade star, that the ones from isolation to trade, it, um, it means that, that, that uh, you, you gain more when you open up to MP. So that's, uh, we call it MP complements. If they were less, we call it MP substitutes and independent if they were the same. And then I'm not going, I don't have time, so I'm not going to do it, but basically research-wise, how we proceed, we, we work a case under symmetry. So we could have uh, all the objects of interest, these Gs, these G gains in terms of parameters instead of those, the sufficient statistic approach. And, and we could see extreme cases where, you know, we could characterize these gains and put signs. And that's what was done in the paper. And then the calibration of the model tell us, was telling us where we were, okay? But how we would, I mean, there was like no bells and whistles. So we have a bunch of bells and whistles to the model to make it more quantitative. So we added intermediates. We had only tradable goods. We had non-tradable goods. We added and the input-output loops that are very common in the trade literature, etc. So I want to talk uh, two minutes about um, calibration because I think it's more general than just these models. So as I said, gravity is important. This bilateral and trade and empty cost is where we are going to kind of uh, sneak in gravity. So one way to go is to assume that our functions of observables distance. And that's what Joe question was going. So you target observe bilateral trade and MP flows and just um, find the, the, the distance elasticities. Another way of going is like just find these wedges. The tau's and the gammas are the wedges that just match exactly the, what you see in the data. So you have this big matrix of, of, of of parameters and you just match exactly the data. The third alternative that is particular to this model is that if you have the aggregate shares, uh, the bilateral shares, uh, we show in the, in the, in the follow-up paper that there is a unique set of these trilateral flows. So if you are willing to assume that uh, trade costs and um, MP costs are symmetric, you can compute them uh, from these trilateral costs. Okay, of course you don't have them in the data. So what we did is we imposed consistency at the aggregate level. The model speed up uh, uh, trilateral uh, flows and we just use those simulators to calculate our tals and them. Papers came thereafter that had more data and show that the model doesn't do very well on this side. So that's a matter of maybe future research. So, um, okay, so, 
th that, those are the costs. Then we have the two key elasticities. And this is always like a big deal in these three models and MP. So we have the theta, we have the rho. And again, this was not for this paper, but the subsequent one, we could uh, target what we call an unrestricted gravity uh, regression to map this beta uh, coefficient here. And then if we restricted uh, this gravity equation to one origin, the US that we have, well, the coefficient on the tiles was something that it was informative about the rock. So if we have theta, we could follow the rock. And we call that restricted gravity. So you need data at least from one origin and be able to follow up the route, okay? So that's in our, uh, our Colakis at all paper. And then there is always this, these things, how you, cal how you calibrate the, the scales. There is many ways to go. We in general or go assuming that is proportional to some measure of size, equipped labor and proportional given like some around, around the employment or something like that. So we set it up basically from, from data. And then you will be left in, say, if you incorporate sourcing, you should uh, target some um, intermediate imports of a village to calibrate that CS um, function for the, for the sourcing and maybe intrafarm. That's how we did it. And then some other remaining parameters we have them from the literature. So this is the, how we, we went with this paper. What we were in, like, it really, we didn't have any Krugman force. I mean, things were um, good in this paper. I mean, games were always possible, et cetera. Um, and so we, we start thinking how to, to talk about multinationals in a, in a Helma Melitz Ipro type of setup, but making it more flexible to kind of being able to, again, quantify gains and other effects that maybe these perfectly competitive recurrent models didn't have. So that's why we moved to a model. I call it Krugman Melitz Janemitz EK. And then we, we had a motivation for that. And the motivation is that we realized that we could talk about innovation and production in this type of setups. Um, the idea is that um, goods are produced in one place and ideas are produced in another place. And what made that separation possible are multinational firms. So what's the problem? Some countries specialize in innovation like the US, some others specialize in production, but there is this kind of um, concern, and you saw it play all the time, all these years in, in politics, is that the ones that are specialized in production are worried about low innovation rates, and the ones that specialize in innovation are worried about lo losing jobs in production. So we wanted to see if uh, these type of models, where we put Krugman type forces and EK type forces, uh, will inform this question. And uh, with, I, I think we did. So what we did is this, again, a quantitative. And when I say quantitative, I mean read geography, many countries, and general equilibrium. Um, with innovation and production, those are the, this is the two sector model, right? And it has trade and it has multinationals. And the specialization patterns in innovation and production will reflect comparative advantage and home market effects. The effect that um, firms um, locate in large markets. So, comparative advantage, so innovation will be pulled to places that are relatively more productive in doing innovation than production. And home market effects will tell us that innovation will, pull, will be pulled to places where firms are good at producing anywhere. Okay, so multinationals. And then production is going to be pulled to places that are like um, good at, uh, they have um, absorption potential in the sense that they have high, um, they, they are centrally located, etc. So those are of course specific parameters in the model. Um, and there's going to be some things that are older in the literature, um, for instance, in Venables in the 80s, and that this, and we can have, um, losses from 
um, open it. So that's 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 where the new mechanisms that we introduce in in this paper and some of the the the, the, the stuff the right the the way I wrote the, the the Ricardia model was taken from from this paper. So what 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 we have? So we have um, workers that are allocated to innovation or production, okay, and that's a Roy Frechet model um, standard there. Then we are going. Firms will pay a fixed cost to innovate, and that's the Krugman entry cost. Okay, so this WFE. So I'm I'm going to work with a case where there is endogenous entry of firms, so wages are going to be equalized across uh, across um, sectors. And basically, think about the firms owning the idea to produce a good. Okay, so you pay the cost, this entry cost, and then you get your Melitz productivity. Okay, so the outcome of innovation is stochastic. And here the methodological contribution was that we introduced these multivariate Pareto distributions in farm productivity. So there's going to be farm location specific um, productivity. It's different from the fresh air. This is not a head to head competition model. And then countries, this, this, we are going to have countries that differ in their productivity across goods, and then countries that differ in the quality of these ideas, okay, or these, um, these blueprints. Okay, and that will give some variation in comparative advantage in innovations versus production. So that we are going to have geographic barriers to trade and MP, and then firms will choose where to produce according to this barrier. So we are going to have taus, we are going to have gammas, and we are going to have also fixed export costs, you know, like in the Melitz model. And then typical continuous varieties, CS aggregator, and here monopolistic competition, as in Helma Melitz. So what is this multivariate Pareto? I mean, it, the intuition is similar to the, one, the distributions I've been talking about. I mean, Pareto is good for this, um, for, for Krugman type, Melitz type, sorry, models, okay? So we are not, there is, each firm produce a variety and there is monopolistic competition. It's not like the Ricardian model that we are competing and whoever is more efficient kicks the other out, okay? So they, as long as I, we produce different varieties, well, the more inefficient we have a lower market share, but it, it will be there as long as profits are profits are positive, right? So this multivariate Pareto, that's the trick as we did with this multivariate fresh aid, introduce some correlation across locations for a farm. Okay. So um, um Basically, here it is raw regulates the heterogeneity across locations and theta regulates still the heterogeneity over varieties that here correspond to farms. And then we introduce this, this, this comparative advantage in production versus innovation through these T's. We are going to assume that it has a, an E component and a T component. Okay, so a country that has comparative advantage in innovation has relatively higher the TE than the TP. So that's that's the, the setup. I'll, I will tell you an isomorphism about this distribution in a, in a little bit, in a couple of slides. Okay, um, so um, um, again, why we want this multivariate Pareto? Because it will aggregate this model really nicely, okay? So we are going to have a unit cost from farm C, uh, from country R, serving L, and from L. This is going to be a, a, a random variable and it will have a, a nice distribution. That's the thing, okay? And because the, the problem will, have, it will be a bit different from before. So the firms will choose the cheapest location for produce each group, okay, and L. So we'll, we we'll choose the army of this C's. And then we see when that happens, it will kind of see if profits are positive or not. So um, there's going to be a, thre a, 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 a threshold um, and they're going to produce if this 
C is such that it's below K okay, and, and gives positive profits. So remember, they have to, to pay this export cost. So what the multivalue Pareto give, give us is these close form probabilities, these conditional probabilities um, will have a closed form and that will translate in having closed form for aggregate flows. Again, we are taking the model to the data, so we really want to have transparency on that. So at the farm level, going back to the proximity concentration trade-off, I didn't say anything about the previous model. That model delivers the proximity concentration trade-off at the aggregate level, the one we saw in the data. This one too, but it doesn't have it at the farm level. Okay, I don't have any uh, any force of that. So we call it proximity comparative advantage trade-off at the farm level. So um, as I said, the model has two sectors, production and innovation. So we can we can see what happened with innovation share. We want to see what happened with innovation when countries open up or or, 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 or have higher barriers to trade, et cetera, all of that. So we can compute it in this model and it's just the fraction of the wage bill to innovation workers over total expenditure. Now, what is this share? Well, this share um, is composed of um, a parameter that captures the sales shares of profits, but it's also the, the innovation share in autarky. So when you open up, and you can go up or down for not your key. You go up if X is bigger than Y. And that means if X is bigger than Y, it means that you have a trade deficit. Because remember, this model has multinationals, has profits floating around. So you need current account balance, not trade up, trade balance. Okay, so you can have trading balances here. So R is going to be bigger than eta, innovation under a turkey as long as X is bigger than Y. And as I said, that's a trade deficit, okay? So these countries will specialize in production, in innovation. So it's like the US. So you are, they're going to import goods and they're going to repatriate profits from multinationals. So the US is an innovation hub. Other countries will specialize in production and they're going to sell goods to the rest of the world. So they will have Y bigger than X. They will have a trade surplus. Okay, they're going to be production half, they're going to export goods and then send profits of multinationals abroad. Think Ireland, for instance. Okay, and why they are production halves? Well, they're relatively more productive in production, but also they are centrally located, say, to serve the EU. That's why they have that. Okay, so all these forces are in play and they shape this innovation trade. Um, the gains from openness now, they're exactly as before, but they have this extra term that comes from this entry channel, this innovation channel, and it has to do with also the deficit, okay? So only because we have this extra term is that now the gains from openness, right? And also from NT and or from trade can be negative, can be less than one, okay? So, um, is really in this Krugman model, Krugman, with these Krugman type forces, uh, we open the door to these losses from openness and um, from multinationals and from trade. How pl plausible is in the, in the data when we quantify the model? It wasn't the case that this was big enough to overturn this direct effect, but you could imagine exercise where it is, okay? Also, because we have these workers underneath, we can also compute who wins, who, who gains, who loses every time we, we shard the economy. So um, I'm, I, I think I have five minutes, right? Um, so I wanna talk about um, uh, four isomorphisms that we work, and I think they're very useful, but they're in the online appendix of the paper. Nobody never reads them. But I think it's, it's really useful for, for when crafting these models. So the first one is that this multivalue Pareto productivity is isomorphic, it's equivalent to have a Melitz core productivity phi times a farm location specific independent pressure productivity, CL. So 
it's the same. It's the same model. Okay, you're going to end up with the same stuff. So um, um, the multivariate Pareto gives you maybe more flexibility. So the, here the fee introduced correlation because you know it's common across within the farm, across locations, and then you have this CL parameter. This, for instance, is the setup in Felix Tintel Nodes uh, job market paper, but they are equivalent. Then the other thing that is there, and I think this is uh, imp uh, interesting, is like this Krugman Mitzi K model of MP and trade is equivalent, equivalent to a two sector model where one sector is Krugman, free entry monopolistic, and the other sector is EK, EK head to head. So if you work that model, you are going, it's like talking about a model of MP because MP at the end of the day, the day is entry of farms, okay? So uh, that's one thing. The other thing that we show in this appendix is like, I was talking about innovation and innovation is like creating products. It's like the, it's like Melitz or Krugman, right? So that's, that's what it really is. But we show in the appendix that it's, equivalent to have process innovation, where process innovation is just, um, you make some investment, um, it's mechanic to lower unit cost of production. And finally, and, and this is maybe, uh, this one took us a long time, if, if you are willing to assume the model under independence, the multivariate Pareto with zero correlation, uh, this model that doesn't have, um, production fixed cost is equivalent with a model with production fixed cost, okay? And there's some very mild conditions. So just to say a word about that, a model with plan level uh, where to open a multinational, you will pay again, you have to pay this plan fixed cost in each location, that will make the problem very difficult, right? Because it's kind of a combinatorial problem. Um, and it's the problem like Felix has in his job market paper. Um, and so we show that if you are willing to assume independence, this for equal to zero, actually there is a, an equivalence between the two modes. It's good news. It saves you a lot of um, computation, okay? So let me talk in the last uh, three minutes, I think, uh, about uh, spillovers. Um, and, and here I just, um, and, and I'm like just putting papers that kind of expand or these things like um, with trade, these trade and MP models that, um, that, that expand the models as they were, but they are like, some results are surprising, right? So um, I think like uh, it's, 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 they're very nice papers in general. So uh, I can talk more in the Q and A. So let me tell you something about. I want to finish with these spillovers, the state of the art in empirics, because um, what I what I mean by this, I mean that uh, we mean by these spillovers that you have an incumbent firm and they increase productivity when a more productive foreign firm locates nearby. Nearby in quotes. So traditionally. Um, the, the empirical analysis, when that we have the dependent variable, some outcome variable for a domestic farm, and the control or the independent variable was some measure of nearby multinational activity. And this, there were many papers in the past, the results were mixed, even with some level data, this was very difficult to identify. So more recently in the 2000s, um, people start refining the channel of the spillover. For instance, backward linkages. Who are your suppliers? Okay, instead of like overall, no, just let's look at that particular channel that is Jaworski's uh, 2004 paper and a rich literature thereafter. Now, the state of the literature is that the data became so detailed that we can really identify um, channels really uh, clearly. So we have fun to firm data because countries that have the VAT can have this type of data. We have employer employee data. Um, some very cleverly done natural experiments. 
So let me talk briefly about the three. I, I don't want you to read the whole slide. So I think the paper that is really important and they're being follow up for, for countries like Ethiopia with multinational is this large plan opening paper by um, Greenstone and co -ops. So where they use the opening of new plants, of large new plants, $1 million plants across US, US counties, and they use this information from this site selection magazine that is really good if you're interested in multinationals to, to look once in a while, where they report counties that were chosen by, by these plants and countries that were almost chosen, but they, at the end they lost the bid, okay? So the identification strategies just compare those, those two um, incumbent plants in these two types of counties. Um, there is, um, there is uh, a bunch of um, exercise there to make sure that we're identifying the right, the right thing. But there were uh, follow-up papers for, for instance, as I say, Ethiopia, where the government was uh, were allocating across regions these large plants. And the authors use that variation, for instance. So um, I, I think this is a promising way of identifying spillovers. Then recently, there is this paper for the US, Brad <clears throat> Salder and Felix, that they use employer-employee em data. These are for tax filing. These data are amazing. They identify multinational. Surprisingly enough, we knew little about multinationals in the US. Um, they are not identified in the US census. So you have to go another way. Uh, the VA is separate from the US census now. census. now there is an effort to put all the data together. So now we'll be able to identify them. Um, and they can use uh, modern econometric techniques from the labor literature to these two way fixed effects to identify um, direct effects and uh, indirect effects of, of uh, multinationals. What I like a lot about this paper is that we always forget about the trade-off and they bring it to the table very clearly. So basically you gain from having multinational, but governments, state governments, local governments spend a lot of money trying to attract them. So they kind of put together those two forces. It's like these mega deals, right? So I think that has to be brought to the table when analyzing these spillovers. And finally, there is um, the case of Costa Rica, I'll call it, because all these papers are, are, are run thanks to very rich data from Costa Rica, employer-employee data and fund to fund uh, data from Costa Rica. And again, these studies like some channels um, to like the, the supplies channel to identify a, a type of spillover. The paper are re is very rich on the empirical design. I encourage you to read it. I, I think it's very interesting. And finally, there is a new paper a historic, uh, with a historical experiment by Rihanna Van Patten, the United Fruit Company, the infamous United Fruit Company that had plantations in Costa Rica and other Central American countries. And she exploits a new channel, monopsony power of this farm on how affected development at that point and maybe thereafter. And she's playing a quasi-random assignment of land. They changed the assignment of land to this company, um, and she she focused on that. Um, so, what's next? What I think where the big big topics for multinationals are. Well, I think dynamics is a understudied topic, um, not less because data are difficult to get and models are difficult to work with. Taxation is another one. Um, there are, again. There is some restrictions on the theory part, but I think it's very important to try to understand these issues. One way of, of that FDI takes are uh, mergers and acquisitions. We in general don't, dis don't distinguish mergers and acquisitions from Greenfield FDI, that they have important differences. And maybe there is a big literature in corporate finance, but not in the trade literature. Also, what's the role of MNEs in automation and, and the adoption of robots and how that will, will play with offshoring. I think that's, that's a growing area. And finally, um, this global value chains, not only in production, but also in R&D. So MNEs slice the R&D chain across countries the same way they slice the production chain. And 
again, not all are and is the same. Um, there may, might be more gains of doing one, some and not other. Well, we need to see it in maybe in, with the theory and, and the data. So thanks very much. Yeah, I'm on time. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, let's open things up for questions. Um, I'll start with the front row. If there are people who have questions, please just go right ahead. Hello, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Natalia. I love your presentation. And um, I was thinking throughout all the presentation, just as this first point about the dynamics. Uh, I'm trying to understand how this uh, entry fix cost of uh, multinational works, because this multinational is actually like entering the market, but it's static decision, right? I think. Uh, yeah. I I guess it's super difficult to to make this a dynamic problem inside this very complex static problem, but uh, I don't know what, what I don't know if you if you have thought about this problem or or or, or, or yeah. So we we have a paper with dynamics and we need to sacrifice some stuff, right? Um, always the the you want some trick to make the problem separable. That's kind of, if, if not, I mean, I don't know even how to start solving it, even in the computer, like um, in a dynamic setup. So we, we, have a, um, we have a trick where basically, if you assume independence across markets, you, 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 can, you can solve the model. Like if you were looking, when I say independence, I mean, uh, um, and avoid the, the complex problem means that you are looking at profits here, right? In country A, and you say, oh, I enter or not. And, and it's not linked to what you do in country B, okay? So of course, in static setups, we have already people working this problem. There is the entrance um, for Tantintel, not for sourcing. And, and there are algorithms that allows us to do that. Maybe at some point we need to put them together. We haven't come up with a way of using the, the complex combinatorial problem in dynamics, to be honest. But that's very interesting and, and fruitful area, I would say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Great presentation again. Thank you. Natalia, I have a question for you from Maria Prusevich. She says, how do these models capture productivity spillovers for the countries where multinationals locate? That's obviously something that people think about a lot in the policy side. I know that lots of policymakers are convinced there must be big productivity spillovers. Yeah, so there is no spillovers. Okay, he's, I don't know if you can hear my dog, but he waits till the end. <laughs> um, um, so the, there is no spillovers in the sense that uh, the domestic firm cannot get the productivity from. The, 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 the foreign firm. In that sense, there is no spillover. Of course, there is gains from the country they go because when you measure aggregate productivity, now we have these more productive actors that are there. Okay, there may be some challenge for the labor market through prices. Everything happens to prices in this mode. But yes, I mean, it's easy to put them. Maybe yes, the problem is that that's why I restrict my, my presentation of spillovers to, to the empirics, because I don't think we have like a, the model, I mean, to talk about spillovers. I think the most promising channel, if you allow me to say one more thing about that, is more about the suppliers. Those we can work with, right? So there are suppliers and, you know, they serve better firms, um, there is some learning. So maybe like introducing learning and those relations, that's, that's promising and it's been doing it. People are doing it in, in trade. Other questions from the front row? Um, hello. Yeah. Thank you, Natalia. 
Hi. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, my questions are in uh, twofold. Uh, number one, uh, do you really think uh, this concept of uh, breaking down production process uh, from country to country, I mean, GVCs, basically, uh, do you really think it has had uh, impact on uh, economic growth and development in, in, I mean, with respect to developing countries, number one, uh, because the argument has been um, neither here nor there. Uh, and, and then how do we uh, factor in the role of uh, variation in institution into the model, um, I mean, the particular model, I mean, as a determinant of how, when and how the direction of um, investment uh, will, will flow into the model. I, I don't really see uh, the mention of that. And I think it's very critical. Thank you. Yeah, so that's more, as I said, that's more the research uh, for um, like polyanthropism and, and thereafter research. I mean, uh, there are, for instance, um, um, David Chor's work has been more related to exactly what you say. Here, as I said, there is not a global value change. Really, the, the, the main motive for multinationals to go into countries is market access to consumers. Um, some sourcing can be introduced, uh, but not in the way you are thinking. I think they are to talk about in, in institutions and all that. In fact, the, the work of the in chores, it, it kind of tried to put these um, institution and contracts um, forces into these more quantitative models. So maybe that's a, a, a researcher that you can 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 look for for more answers on that aspect. Um, so th there is this theme, right? You want to go up on the global value chain value, the global value chain high value, right? Uh, um, there is something about that. At least in the data, it seems to we prepare like. Um, for the Asian Development Bank, a report on this, and some of the correlations go on the on the way you expect, right? Mm -hmm. It's better to have some uh, an activity with more global, with more value added in the global value chain um, than than that le less, etc. But um, yes, but it, not in these models. I mean. <laughs> All right, thank it you. It would be great to have all, all in ones. I mean, and I think there are efforts on that direction. Okay. Natalia, along the same lines, perhaps, thinking of, again, the policy side of things, um, there's a lot of conversation about distributional impacts of, of FDI. Um, where is the literature sitting on this? Mm. So in, yeah, in this, in this, one of the concerns for the second paper we wrote was about that. So it, 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 we started like time ago, was, Trump wasn't even president at that point, but there was like uh, these concerns about, um, well, who's gaining, who's losing. That's why we, we even in a, this, if you want simpler model where there is these workers choosing to go to innovation production sector, and they are already rich enough that you can have losses, even for the innovation workers. So um, people are using a lot of this type of framework. Uh, maybe uh, in previous lectures, um, uh, others talked about this, this Roy Frechet type of setups where uh, workers are heterogeneous and they choose where to go. That's the, the, the state of the literature in terms of of modeling, but the concern is there and almost it, it's introduced um, in like in, in the models, like really. And as I said, this um, I didn't highlight that in this in this talk because um, um, it's there and 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 was one of the main concerns uh, why we wrote the the paper. <laughs> So yes. <laughs> what about uh, like multi-factor models where the factor intensity might be different for domestic production versus uh, yeah. you know multinational or FDI? Yeah. 
Do those yeah, so exist? In, or are those yeah, so in manageable, my, tractable? In, in, my, in that literature review, there is one paper. Um, uh, Chang Sung, he wrote a paper on that with capital and how uh, multinationals are different from the, from the local firm. Okay. So, so yeah, there is something. And in general, yes, you see the three bars only have labor. <laughs> um, but, um, but there is some, and there was an old literature in multinationals about can, this. Can you repeat who was the, who was the paper that you just mentioned? Um, was the one by Chang Sung in my SUN in my list? Oh, okay. Uh, MP with non neutral technologies. Slide 35. Um, yes. And I think there is a growing interest in automation and the role of multinationals and how they're going to do their offshoring. There are a couple of very quick questions. Well, some of them are quick and some of them not so quick that have popped up in the last, the closing minutes here, people sneaking in questions before the bell. Um, one I think is a clarification of a point you made earlier from Francisco. He says, quick question regarding R&D and trade. So the domestic firm does not benefit from productivity from the multinational because, is that because research is not done in sight or because it lacks the capital, human or physical to do so, or it's just not there in the model? It's not there. It's like by, by assumption, if you have your blueprint, it's yours. Um, R&D is done in the, in the home country um, and that's it, right? And, and then the effect that is negative, if there is, when the multinational comes in, it can wipe out domestic farms doing R&D. And that's where that negative effect, there might be the negative effect coming from that. And that's a price and, effect. Yeah. Sorry, say it again. That's a price, a price effect. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So there is a paper. Um, again, if you look at that list, FAN, F-A-N, he has R&D offshoring, not spillovers, but offshoring, meaning that the multinational can choose not only where to produce, but where to do R&D. So that might be a starting point. Great. Um, one, one more, and it's probably the last from Kevin Williams. He says, it's a very open-ended question. He says, I'm thinking what role does corruption play in these models? Is it, is it important to consider corruption? Um, it's a big question. question. Yeah. So we, a simple, a simple correlation tells you that these, these multinationals know the higher the corruption, the less the multinational presence, right? Um, there is some literature, uh, it's not modeled explicitly, but that goes like this, if you wish, the general team is like, why you see so much South-South FBI? Well, maybe it's because you have a comparative advantage in working in those type of environments with weak institutions. So I saw papers on that. The theories are difficult, I have to say. I mean, but, but still, I think like, again, the, the work by Paul Antras and Lavin Chor, that's the way um, maybe to go. And, Again, um, there is this idea like multinational till very recently was a phenomenon of the developed countries. There were very few flows to the South, right? And so, and again, the, the same thing for trade, the, the weaker the, law, the rule of law, the less multinational. So, um, and in the rule of law, it includes corruption, right? So that's, that's a fact and it's a, it's a stylish correlation, if not causality, but, um, but still in the models can be difficult, yeah. So thanks, I think maybe that's a good point to stop and simply to say it's, a, it's clearly a field where there's lots of work yet to be done. And so for all of you out there who are students and looking to, looking to carve out spaces there's a ton of important questions, important real world questions. There's a set of models that offer a framework to begin thinking about these things. And the, you know, it's not a blank slate, but there's a lot to build on. 
So on that note, I, I think we should really just thank you, Natalia, for um, for taking the time and again for the the contribution out of the kindness of your heart and the commitment to the to sharing knowledge. I wonder if those of you who are in the front row would do what we've been doing and unmute yourselves um, briefly so we can give Natalia just a, a round of applause. So thank you, Natalia. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, the feel is open. Um, work on it. It's great. <laughs> thank you. So thanks very much to everyone. And um, we hope you'll come back tomorrow. We have our last lecture in the whole, in the whole course. Klaus Desmet's going to be talking about urbanization. So please do join us. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Many thanks again to Natalia. Many thanks to the CEPR team. And uh, have a good afternoon, evening, or whatever time of day it is for you. So long. Thank you. Bye, Natalia. Thank you.